was haunted. People would come and go like it was a perpetually revolving door. The longest anyone stayed was about six months. It was a normal house, upper middle class, tan, with a white picket fence and a good sized deck and a decent yard. The only slightly creepy thing about this house was that the man who had owned the house had buried all of his dead pets in the back garden. So it was an animal graveyard of sorts. It sat empty for quite some time and this is where my experience begins. I was in high school when this happened, probably my freshman year. I had gotten together with two friends, Carol and Erin, and we were trying to figure out what to do to keep us from being bored. We then mutually decided to go check the house out and see what all the fuss was about. We walked through the open gate and into the back garden. A cable man had recently come by to do some work, which was very odd since no one actually lived there and had left the gate open. After standing there for about a minute, we decided to play hide and seek in this new area. We looked around the place and decided to draw the boundary at the front of the back garden. Going inside was off limits. I would count and they would hide. Well, I found Carol almost immediately and she decided to help me find Erin. We looked around for about a minute or so when we heard a noise that sounded like movement in the house. Almost as if someone was scurrying across the floor. We assumed that our friend had broken the rule and gone inside the house. Erin! We shouted at the house. You know inside's off limits, get back out here! We expected to hear the door creak open and Erin just to walk outside talking about how she just wanted a look when we hear her come out from behind the bushes, explaining that she wasn't in the house. We then look at each other with horror on our faces and slowly turn and look towards the large windows that look over the garden. The house is pitch black so it is impossible to see inside. We aren't there for very long when I see something directly in front of the window. It's a young girl, maybe 11 or 12. The only thing that's out of place are her clothes. She's wearing this dark dress with a high collar and two braids down the back, almost like something from a history book. She looks sad and then starts mouthing something to me. I couldn't figure out what she meant, but I see something behind her that made my blood run cold. It was a man, a really tall man. He had a look of pure hatred on his face. His hand reached out to choke the girl standing in front of him, and just as fast as he appeared, they disappeared. I came back to reality and turned to look at my friends. They looked like they had seen a ghost. I turned to my friend Erin and asked her what she saw, and she described the little girl exactly. We hightailed it out of there as fast as we could, and we have never been back. We finally understand why people do not stay long in that house. About seven years ago, when I was about 17 or so, my best friend and I decided to relive a bit of our childhood by hanging out at one of those huge outdoor wooden playgrounds at night. My best friend had invited one of her friends to join us and the three of us then played hide and seek. Now is a good time to point out that my town is incredibly boring and is one of those make your own kind of fun places. Hence why we were there. Throughout the evening, my friend took several pictures of us as well. Some on monkey bars, 
others sliding down slides, and during our last game of hide and seek, I decided to break the rules and hide in the car, out in the parking lot. I stayed in my ingenious hiding spot for several minutes before giving up and returning to the middle of the playground to meet up with the other two. When I returned, my best friend had the most peculiar look on her face. She was confused because she said that she had seen me on the opposite side of the playground. Supposedly, when she saw me, I was standing up, just staring into the distance with my mouth agape, with the most terrified look on my face. My best friend said she confronted me and asked me what was wrong if I was okay. She said that I didn't respond, but rather just kept staring, mouth wide and shocked. She assumed that I was trying to scare everyone, so she ran off to carry on with the game. And that's when I entered the opposite side of the playground. My best friend recounted all of those events to me, and I stood by the truth that I cheated and hid in the car. Logistically, it would have been impossible for me to have made it all the way over around the six foot fence surrounding the playground in such a short amount of time. I completely believe my best friend and that she was not fabricating this whole story. And she completely believes that I was hiding in the car when she saw my doppelganger. Lastly, after we brushed off the incident and went home, the photographs were quite peculiar. Surrounding me and only me in the photos was a thick haze outlining my body. The weather was normal, not too hot, not too cold, which dispels the suspicion that it was steam coming off me, but we have absolutely no idea what it was. And it is incredibly weird. This happened when I was 10. There are about five or six of us spending the night at my friend Charlie's house. Her parents owned a ranch in the hill country region of Texas and their home was built on the top of a hill. Other than the dirt driveway up to her house, the hill was wild land covered in cedar trees. It was a clear, slightly chilly night in October or November, but long after the sun had gone down and the moon had risen, we stayed out playing hide and seek using the driveway as a base. Their ranch was far enough out of town and well fenced, so her parents didn't have a problem with it. Anyway, during one of the rounds of hide and seek, me and my friend Gina were the last two hidden, and we were so good at hiding, the seekers found everyone else and had enlisted them to find us. Or so we thought. We had almost made it back to the road when three of the girls unknowingly cut us off and so we ducked down behind a ridge and remained concealed. Gina then threw a rock across the road behind them to divert their attention. We were waiting for them to get far enough off the road to make a dramatic rush for the safety of the base when I heard what sounded like a rock being dislodged and sliding down the hill behind us. I thought Gina might have done it, so I didn't say anything, but she kind of looked at me and asked if I was okay. I was about to reply when we heard what sounded like one of our friends, Charlie, calling from way down the hill behind us. Help me. We bolted straight up and yelled at the others and they came running back to the road and we told them what we had heard. No one had seen Charlie since we started that round of hide and seek. We took them to the spot where we had hidden from them and called out Charlie's name. For a moment it was all quiet. Then, faintly, even further down the hill, we heard her say, Help, I'm stuck. We panicked and ran up the driveway as fast as we could, getting her parents. 
when we burst through the kitchen door, ready to yell for her mum and dad. She was sitting at the bar, eating a popsicle. I wondered how long it was going to take you all to find me, she gloated. We all flipped out, in the way that only ten-year-old girls can. Her parents heard us freaking out downstairs and came down to see what was going on. We told them what had happened and her dad grabbed his shotgun and got into his truck. He went down the drive, around the ranch, making sure there wasn't anyone on the property who wasn't supposed to be there. And he didn't find anything. I've always wondered what we've heard that night, as it wasn't just me, it was many people. We don't talk about it much, but I know it remained in all of our minds every time we stayed there past sundown. My family had just moved into a house in the States. It was my first time being there, and I was five years old, and for some strange reason, I was excited more than anything. My younger brother was running around the house, and I called to him, and he came over, and I asked him if he wanted to play a game. Upon having a think, we decided the game should be hide and seek. So he went out to hide, and I counted to twenty. When I was done counting, I went looking for him and I couldn't find him. So I began yelling for him. Raymond! Raymond, where did you go? I went to the very top of the house, the third floor. And I thought to look in the closet. He wasn't there. But I did find something. A door. There was a door inside the closet. For some reason I thought to open it. I was only five and curiosity got the best of me. So I opened the door and inside it was nothing more than an empty room. Empty except for a desk and a man and his typewriter. I walked up to him and I asked him, why are you in my house? I know a lot of you might think, why didn't I freak out as a five-year-old? But there was just this strange sense of trust I got from him. As he looked at me in surprise, he looked down at me and just said, Jose, you're not supposed to be in here. I asked him who he was and his only response was, Jose, shouldn't you be looking for your brother? I bet he's worried about you. I looked up at him and he looked back and I remembered his face seemed quite average. Nothing about him was strange other than the fact that he was wearing all white. He held my hand and told me I should keep looking for my brother. He opened the door and closed it behind me. I didn't think much of it, like I said I was only five. So I went looking for my brother and I found him in the kitchen under the sink. I never told him about the man in the closet, mostly because I wanted the man in the closet to be my friend, not his. Anyway, that was the first time I met him, although it was not my last. The second time, my mother was fighting with my stepfather. I couldn't leave the house, so I hid in the closet. My little brother was at my aunt's house, so it was just me and them. It had been weeks and I had tried to visit the man in the closet, but time after time I would look in the closet and the door simply wouldn't be there. Was it a dream? Did I just imagine it in my young mind? But no, this time it was different. This time, he opened the door. Just as I saw the light from the floor, he told me to come inside quickly, and I did. I have no idea how long I was in there with this man, and for some strange reason, I trusted him. I never questioned how he knew my name without telling me. I never asked him for his name. The only personal thing that I knew about this man was that he was from Germany. After talking for what felt like hours, he told me it was fine to leave. He held my hand and opened the door. Everything's going to be fine, Jose. 
It might look like it's always going to be this way, but don't worry. Keep your chin up, okay? As soon as he had led me out, the door closed behind me, and when I looked back, the door was gone again. I walked out of my closet, and it turned out I was in the closet for about three hours, and my mother had been frantically looking for me. As time went by, the door behind the closet just seemed never to show up anymore. Until the very last day at that house when we were moving out, my little brother was downstairs with my mother, and I wanted to just check one last time. I told my mum I would be back, and I told her I had left some toys in my room. I went to my room, and then checked the closet. I saw the door, behind the clothes, and in the closet. So I went to open the door, and I walked in and I saw him typing away furiously on his typewriter. I asked him why he hadn't been around, and he just looked at me with that face that said it hurts inside. I just looked at him and said, I thought you were going to be here for me, and he kept looking back at me with a face that just said, I'm sorry.